I came back to work on uh, Wednesday. It was kind of weird being off for like 10 days because you start forgetting what day it is. Is that what retirement's like? It was kind of unusual. Um, so when I came back to work on Wednesday, um, I, got, I got a phone call right away, and I was really busy because I hadn't been here, so there was a whole lot of things piled up when I got here. Uh, and I received a phone call from one of our former parishioners, a young, a young man with a young family uh, who moved away a couple months ago. And uh, he was uh, all excited. And I'm like, wow, you know, what's the news? And he said, well, he said, uh, my son, uh, who has special needs, uh, has you know, suffered. And I, I know because I've known the, 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 little, the boy since birth. Uh, I think he's 12 now. Um, said that he's uh, you know, suffered seizures and it's unpredictable and it's, you know, it's wreaked havoc on their family. And he was born with learning disabilities. And I, as a father with a son with learning disabilities, mild autism, I, I totally relate to this family. Uh, but he said every so often the doctor has them uh, take, take a test uh, of his brain because there's these lesions on his brain that cause the, the seizures, etc. So he's always had these with him since birth. Uh, and he said, I'm calling you today to tell you that there's no lesions. They, they, can't, they can't find a lesion. Yeah, praise God. And this, is, this is part of my sermon. Because <laughs> the sermon is about giving thanks to God. And so this is what he, we had a Pentecostal moment on the telephone. You know, like, it was a hallelujah. I mean, it was like, he's like, this is amazing. Uh, and uh, it, the guy's a former Air Force, you know, officer and squared away guy, thinker type, you know. Uh, but to see him emotional and excited, I mean, what dad would not be? And he said, the doctor's like blown away. Like, where'd they go? Like, you and I both know where they went, right? Uh, and you got to think about because I've prayed, you know, even with my own son that God would bless and, and do things. And sometimes God answers and blesses when you have a special needs child. Sometimes he doesn't. You've got to go with what God decrees. And in this situation, for some reason, God said, I remove those. So praise God for that. Now, that doesn't mean that the little boy is out of the woods because he has an onion skin of issues, as all special needs kids do. But the parents can cling to that one major little victory, right? And what should a Christian do when God does something amazing in your life that's off the charts, that's jaw-dropping? Who looks at that and goes, oh, that's cool. What's for lunch? Uh, who does that? No, when you look at that and you start giving praise to the wife, Praise to neighbors you don't even know, hugging people, telling them, hey. Uh, and that's what he was doing with me because I've been with the little boy uh, it, when he was born because I had to be with the family because the little boy was going to die uh, when I showed up at the hospital. Uh, and, and the dad told me in, the, in, the, in a room off to the side, he's like, what am I going to do if my firstborn dies? How do I function as a dad? But then God, God gave him this gift of a child, and then that little child ended up not being normal. Then, it, then he's a gift in a different way. And I understand all that as a dad with a child like that. So what's a dad do? He gives thanks for all those things. And so I just challenge you, as you look at Psalm 136, it's all about giving thanks to God. Uh, and have you devised your list of thanks to God? Because that's what you should be doing is giving thanks to God. Now, I know in our world uh, there is plenty to be uh, despondent about, upset about, and in despair over. Uh, but as a Christian, you need to look at those things. And they're, they're troubling as you watch people uh, trade... Uh, Morality for immorality and logical thinking for logical thinking. All our culture does. But you need to stop for a minute and just, and just pause on the things that God does. Sometimes they're amazing movements of God like this that you have to give thanks for. Sometimes they're smaller things of God. But based on Psalm 136, your entire lifestyle should be built around giving thanks. Giving thanks to him. Uh, this is a, and and it's, a, it's a public thing. It's, it's supposed to be public praise. Because this song, as I told you two weeks ago, was an antiphonal song. Uh, where, where they, where the uh, worship leader, as it were, in the temple would say words, and then they would then repeat uh, the similar refrain all throughout the passage. So he would say, uh, thanks uh, to the Lord for he is good, and then the people would say, his love uh, endures forever. And then, then he would say, give thanks to the God of gods, and then the people would say, well, his love endures forever. And so this went all throughout this passage, this antiphonal reading of back and forth, and you could hear the hum of thanks. So if anybody walked out of a temple service, and you were to ask them as they're leaving, hey, what was the service about today? If you didn't understand it was about thanks, you need to go back in there. And so I would tell you today, we're going to look at thanks and giving thanksgiving um, because it is part and parcel to what we are as believers. So because it's been two weeks, brain cells have died, correct? And you're wondering, who's the dude in the suit? <laughs> yeah, some people are ask, some young people are asking me today, what has happened? What's happened? <laughs> no, I just put on a suit. I mean, just roll with it. Um, <laughs> so... Let's review for just a second. Okay, so the first three verses to substantiate the premise that public praise is what we're supposed to be all about when God blesses us. Uh, we, we saw in the first three verses that the, the psalmist calls us to, uh, to, to give thanks. It's a command. 
all woven through there are Hebrew words that are based on a command structure. So it's not a suggestion. There is no Christian who's, who, who can say, yeah, I am totally off the hook on giving thanks to God. That's, that's your gift. No, no, it's for everybody. So whether the glass is half full, the glass is half empty, everybody's supposed to be giving praise to God uh, and thanks for things that he does in your life. Now, the causation of, of that praise is verses 4 to 25. Uh, and so he's going to give four historical snapshots from Israel to tell them the reason why they as a nation gave thanks to God. And we, we could do this. I mean, we could say, if we put together our own four snapshots as a nation, what would we praise God for as Americans, you could say? And it'd be easy to come up with four, would it not? Five people agree? Couldn't you come up with four things you're thankful about as, a, as an American? Absolutely. Um, but as a Christian American, at four, four would be easy. So we're going to look at their list. So don't look at their list and go, it's got nothing to do with me. No, it's got everything to do with you. Because even if their list is not your list, you should have a list of the cause of the thanks that you give to God. So what is your causation? So snapshot number one, or exhibit number one if you're an attorney. Verses four to nine. We already looked at this, we're reviewing. Remember, you already forgot what we're reviewing. Uh, what did we find there? Snapshot number one, why should you be moved to praise? It is because God is the one who created the cosmos and all the complexity of it. I mean, how can you look at a telescope or look at a microscope uh, and not see the interest, intricate complexity or the fingerprints of God Almighty? And it just, it's just stunning to, to study and see all of those things. So we already went through that with the fine-tooth comb. Uh, just the general revelation in the world should move you to give thanks to God for what you see. Um, I had a lady actually, between the last two sermons, stopped me and said, you know, I was working out in my yard after that sermon, and I actually stopped and thanked God for my tomato plants that I had, you know, that are now, you know, dying off. But thank God for blessing my life. Is that worthy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, it, God brings all of these things. And so get, stop to give thanks to God for these little things. Now we want to dive into more of the meat of their history. Verses uh, 10 to 15 is snapshot uh, or exhibit number two. Uh, here you, you find uh, he's going to go through their freedom from uh, uh, captivity in Egypt. So verse 10, he says, To him, speaking of God, to him who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn, for his loving kindness is everlasting, and brought Israel out from their midst, speaking of Egypt, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And the word loving kindness in Hebrew, chesed, means a loyal love. I mean, you can't shake it. Um, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And he made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his loving kindness in that event, he says, is everlasting. But he overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Boy, did he, for his loving kindness is everlasting. He says, we can never forget as a nation that God saved us. I mean, think about it. That they who were slaves for hundreds and hundreds of years, they who thought there was no way they could ever escape the powerful grip of the Egyptian forces. They were freed, not by their own might, by the hand of God. And so God, that's why it says, to him who smote. Who did the smiting? God. God had a contest with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh would not submit. And God said, I'm going to smite you. And God did. God gave him chances to repent. With the revelatory light the Jews brought to their nation, they rejected the light. So after hundreds of years, God says, I judge your nation, and I free my people. And it was based on his strategy, his providential strategy, uh, to free them powerfully, not their strategy. But it was an ironic way in which God did it. So I want to touch upon just some of the ironies that are denoted in verses 10 and 15 here. Uh, of when God moves, you can't stop him. So think about the ironies. Uh, he used a former Egyptian, Moses, whom Josephus says was an actual general in the, in the Egyptian army. He used a, a former e uh, Egyptian to defeat the Egyptians. This is ironic. And number two, he used a vile decree to kill all the male Israelite babies in chapter one uh, to place one baby that was saved in power to redeem the nation. That's totally ironic. That's almost like what Herod did, right, with Jesus. We'll just wipe out the line and then there won't be a Messiah. Now we'll wipe out the line and there won't be a Moses. Uh, number three, he used an old man, boy, did he, to gain victory of an old, strong, young man, Pharaoh, uh, is how God used it. So if you're older today, what's older? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm thinking anything over maybe 105 at this point, but um, uh, he used the, uh, the ruthless plan of, the, of Pharaoh to kill all those little Israelite babies to be the catalyst to judge the firstborn of all of Egypt. That's called lex talionis. What goes around comes around. 
Uh, and uh, additionally, he, he, was, he was the true God, who is the true God, uh, used his status to destroy all the pantheon of the Egyptians, which is what the plagues were all about. Because even the dividing of the Red Sea was the God Yom, the great, the great God that you could not divide. What did God say to water? I created it. I can part it. And that's what he does. Uh, he strategically placed his people in a weak position so he could show himself strong. So next time you think that you're in bondage, you're in slavery, look to God. He's greater than your situation. He uses the underdog to, to achieve amazing things. So when you are, when you are weak, this is when Jesus comes along and tells Paul with his thorn in the flesh, no, Paul, I'm going to leave the thorn in your side because when you are weak, then I'm strong in you. And Paul embraced that. So he made the, when they went into the waters, uh, as God parted the seas, uh, the, the Egyptians went into the waters after the Israelites who went through on dry ground. I mean, as the waters parted. Uh, and, the, and, and the amazing thing is the water, the average depth of the, of the Red Sea is 1,640 feet. So they didn't just walk through, you know, in the shallow end. I mean, <laughs> could you imagine as the water's peeling? Did you see the movie with Cecil B. DeMille back in the day? As, you know, uh, Moses, stand and see the hand of God, you know? And then the water starts peeling back and the ground dries instantly and all the Jews step in and walk to the other side and they estimate there must have been about two million of them. And they got to the other side and in came, you know, the chariots, the mighty chariots of the Egyptians uh, and it says in Exodus 4, 14, 25, that when they got into the seabed, God made the wheels of the chariots come off. Problem. Major problem. So think of the irony of this. Where sandals had just gone, a mighty chariot could not go. Why? God said, I'm going to judge your army. So the thing they feared the most, the Egyptian army, God took it out. In just a small event. See, this is divine deliverance. And so what the divine liver, deliverance does show about the mercy and the love of God that you can't shake uh, to the Israelites as they recounted this in worship and sang this antiphonally was God had heard their cry of the people. It just took a couple hundred years for God, God to get geopolitical situations aligned to be right at the moment that he would deliver them. But it wasn't as if he hadn't, hadn't heard them. So when you are in slavery, as it were, a, a difficult, afflicting situation, and you pray and shout out to God, don't think he does not hear. He always hears his saints. He had heard. Uh, God had not forgotten his people. Have you not ever felt that way in a, in a point of affliction to say, where is God? He, heaven is brass. Has he forgotten me? No. No, he hears from heaven. He's waiting for things to be politically, personally aligned so he can move. Uh, like in this family that I opened with. They got things just right after 12 years for them, God, to do something amazing. Um, uh, so God is loving his people in listening to them and freeing them from, from Moses. And his name, his name was the first word I learned how to read in Hebrew. I was sitting by the pool one day. Uh, I just learned the alphabet, how, all the tonal qualities of the consonants. And I'm working on the vowel structure. That was a whole other thing. I was sitting by the pool and I was looking at the name Moses. And I, I was sitting down there by myself. And, and I said, Moshe. And I was like, Eureka. I started screaming. Liz came out of the apartment. What's going on? What's going on? You getting mugged or something? No, it's awesome. I can see it. It says Moshe. She's like, what does that mean? It's Moses. What does it mean? Well, it means to be drawn out of water. Isn't that interesting? God uses a little baby floating in a basket, drawn out of the water to deliver an entire nation. And he waited till that guy was like, how old? In his 80s. So I don't know how old you are today. 80s looking awful young. Uh, don't think I'm retired I'm living on my investments, uh, and God's done with me. Uh-uh. No, you got to think, God may have just started with you. Just trying to encourage you. The older people, they're not sounding too excited right now. Like, well, I'm kind of tired. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, back to the sermon. It's too convicting. Um, so God freed them. So you have to ask yourself, well, I'm not in bondage. You know, no, no, no. But, but you were in bondage before you knew Jesus. You were, I was in bondage before I knew Jesus. And once I found out I was in bondage, uh, then something had to happen because I knew I was in sinful bondage. But when you got freed from that, it was like, it was like an exodus, wasn't it, not when you got freed? So what, what, what was your freedom that you would thank God for? God freed me from this. So I'm going to stop because it's supposed to be public praise, right? Okay, now's the time. This is not a rhetorical question demanding no response. What did God free you from when he saved you? What was the word? Sin. Well, Sin. <laughs> This is a biblical church. Yes. Okay, we just solved it right there. I'm talking, let's go down the ladder of, uh, uh, from general to specific. Generally, he freed us from sin. Specifically, what? What? Addiction. Pride. 
What else? Anger. Yeah, I've been there. What is it? Selfishness. What else? What? Grieving. Adultery. Yeah, he freed us from not being able to have a relationship. So now you have a relationship. I mean, he, so we could go around the room to every Christian here, and, and non-Christians are probably sitting there going, hey, what are they, what are they talking about? <laughs> You're still shackled to sin. And you know you are. When I was convicted of my sin, and I went to my pastor who was a Navy captain, uh, chaplain, and I went to him and I said, Pastor Lynn, I, I'm kind of feeling X, Y, Z in my life. He goes, Marty, you're under the conviction of the Spirit of God. <laughs> yeah, I was nine and I got it. Uh, so if you're like 20 thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you do. Because you feel the conviction of God. You know you're in slavery to sin. So when's the last time you stopped and said, God, thank you for the fact that you saved me from opioid? I was hooked. And my, my sister used to be a, an addict. I mean, when you, when you get free, and my dad was a federal agent, go figure. When you get free, then you have to stop and then th give thanks to God and, and make it a public thing so that other people can see what the hand of God can do in shaping and, and saving a life. I mean, this church should be full of messed up people, right? Who found Christ. Uh, so give thanks to God for his salvation, your exodus experience. Number shot, 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 snapshot number three, uh, verses 16 to 22. It says, to him who led his people through the wilderness after the exodus, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Well, how did God lead his people through the blistering sands of the wilderness? Because I've been out in the Sinai before. I grew up in the deserts of Southern California near Yuma, Arizona. I know what it's like to be muy caliente. Not fun. Translation from the Hebrew is very hot. <laughs> uh, Exodus chapter 13 uh, says this, verse 21. It says, and the Lord, uh, that's the Lord Yahweh, uh, the great creator God, was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day and to led them by the way, and then a, pi a pillar of fire by night uh, to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. Uh, and he did not take away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night before the people. Before the people. This is awesome. How did he lead him in the wilderness? I, I, I don't know if you, I, I grew up in the desert, did all my scouting trips, all my merit badges, everything was always out in the desert. I, I can tell you, you can get lost in the desert easy. Because all the different arroyos, all the little gulches, all the cacti all start looking the same. I have been lost in the desert when it's 116 degrees. Been there, done that. Because we went out one day without a compass, and all my friends that were with me were like, I mean, we don't need that today. We're just going to go chill walking around. Don't ever do it. I did it. Yeah, it was not good. So could you imagine going through the desert, and you have no compass, and, and everything kind of looks the same, all the wadis, all the arroyos and everything, and you're walking around, and then all of a sudden, uh, you, you know, it's like, where are we supposed to go? I can't tell. But, but imagine them in the wilderness. There's two million of them. I mean, there's no place to stop. You see a Dairy Queen? <laughs> when I was a kid traveling across the United States every summer from California to South Carolina to see my dad's 10 sisters and all my aunts and uncles and everything, half the state of South Carolina, Stuckies were everywhere. Remember Stuckies? We had them marked on a map. I still got the map. Stuckies is not there anymore, but it was like an oasis of salvation. You know, they had none of that, so how did they know where they were going? God said, I'll solve that problem for you. I'll put a cloud over you during the day, and as where it goes, you go, and I'll give you a pillar of fire by night, <laughs> swirling around. You can follow that pillar of fire by night, uh, and if you're in the camp, camped around it, and you're afraid of the dark, don't worry about it. It's the ultimate nightlight. I'll be in the pillar of fire. Yeah, but I'm afraid of animals. Well, don't worry about it. The pillar of fire will drive them all away. It's like a massive pillar of a campfire. It's awesome. So that no one could say, where are we going? Following the cloud. Well, I don't know, where, where are we going? Following the pillar of fire. Don't you wish you had one of those? <laughs> don't you wish you could just get up in the morning and you're searching for the will of God and it, honey, it's totally clear, the pillar of fire. <laughs> we are, <laughs> we're moving to Kansas or wherever. You just, you just saw it. But you, you know what? Because you can look at this and go, well, I can see why they would praise God. I mean, they, he led them through the wilderness. That's what it says. He led his people through the wilderness. Boy, did he. Um, I wish I had one of those. I do. I have a pillar of fire. I have, I have a cloud. Um, here's my pillar of fire. Here's my cloud. I've poured over this book since I was a little kid. And I can tell you one thing. As I've read these stories and studied these stories and looked at these saints and looked at their lives and read God's wisdom, there is not a time I don't read it and then it pertains to my life that day in, a, in an amazing way. And you look at it and go, clear direction. Clear direction. Uh, I, today uh, marks 
13 years that I've been at this church, that I came from California. So, I mean, but how do I wind up here? Because I've had a lot of people ask me that that are new. It's like, God led us here after my last church in 19 years in California. God led us here. And he set up all the events for us to get here. Uh, and uh, I, was, I just had a dinner last week uh, with half of the pastoral search committee that doesn't go to church here anymore, which I find kind of odd. I told them, you guys hired me, and then you all moved away. What's up with that? They all retired and moved. It's pretty funny. But if you go back and you look at how did, how did I wind up here, moving across the country, leaving all my friends who said, where are you going? You're out of your mind. Uh, selling my home in the middle of the implosion market in Stockton. The whole market nationally fell in Stockton, California. I mean, all the things that were, you know, like, why would you leave now? Uh, and God opened the doors, brought us here. Uh, well, my wife can tell you, it's, it's the greatest thing we've ever done. Why? Because you're in the will of God. So when you're in the will of God and following the cloud, following the p- pillar, it's like you're invincible. Because you know you're exactly where you're going to be. It doesn't mean the wilderness is easy. It doesn't mean there's not challenges and afflictions along the way. But when you're doing what God wants you to do with the people who are following God, there's nothing better. So I, I don't know about you, but... but but I, I've got that light. This is a lamp unto my feet. It is my pillar of fire. So when you're looking at them saying, well, you know, God doesn't seem to be leading me, then you're not, you're not looking. You're not paying attention because, yes, he does lead as you go into Canaan land. Now, I have to ask you, is going into Canaan land simple? Was it supposed to be simple? Hey, I freed you from the Egyptians. They're going to take you out in the Sinai. It's going to be cruise, simple, no problem for 40 years. No, because it says in verse 17, notice what it says in this antiphonal song. To him who smote great kings, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And he, God, slew mighty kings, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who did they slay? Well, Sihon, king of the Amorites, uh, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And Og, king of Bashan, up in the north, uh, on the uh, eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And he gave their land, the land of the the Amorites, as a heritage to Israel, uh, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Even a heritage to Israel, his servant, for his loving kindness is everlasting. See, God had promised Israel Canaan land. He promised them that land. And that's a whole other study about a whole other moral issue and a whole other spiritual issue. Uh, but God had promised them that land. Why? Uh, well, because uh, from what we read in Leviticus chapter 18, they had been given hundreds and hundreds of years, like almost 700 years, based on the presence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the land of Canaan to repent based on special revelation. And they chose to worship the false gods of the Canaanites, the whole Baal false system of belief and all that that meant. And God gave them hundreds of years to repent. So it's estimated that Abraham came into the land around 2091 BC. Uh, The the taking of the land occurred around 1406 BC. So that's about 685 years to repent. So when you look at the fact that God sent the Israelites, this ragtag group of slaves with not heavy weaponry, they're not skilled in warfare, they're, they didn't go to boot camp, and they're going to take on two of the greatest kings known in that day, Sihon and Og. They took them on, and God sends them to take them on, uh, and they're thinking to themselves, uh, we don't have weaponry like they have. Uh, Og had 60 fortified fortresses in the north uh, on the east side of the Golan Heights, and they're, they, they're just a group of slaves. And God says, no, I'm going to do this for you. See, when God is with you and you, for, you, you face evil itself, you shouldn't fear because God is with you. And so, and so they, they go against these two great warlords, and God says, I'm going, to, I'm going to bless you. They've lost their right to the land. The nations had lost their right to the land. And it says in Leviticus 18 that the land wanted to vomit them out. And you must go back and read Leviticus 18 because it tells you they committed all kinds of sexual sins that moved God to spit them out. One must wonder, what does God think of our land? That's the same God. Nothing has changed. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, here's what God says to Moses. He says, when the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations, which you are going to dispossess, you dispossess them and dwell, dwell in their land. Beware that you are not ensnared to follow after them. Don't give in to peer pressure. After, uh, after they are destroyed before you, that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did those nations serve their gods that I might also do likewise? You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God for every abominable act which the Lord hates, detailed in Leviticus 18, they have done for their gods. And, every, and they even burn their sons and daughters in the fires to their gods. They sacrifice their children to their gods, like Molech. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do that you shall not take away from it at all. Don't alter what I said. 
because God's word and his truth never changes. Yeah, but hey, Lord, I mean, you know, some of those Moabite girls are looking pretty good, you know, and I'm 18. I mean, what could it hurt? I'll witness to her. Uh huh. Yeah, because he says in Deuteronomy 7, do not, do not give your sons and your daughters to them because they will change their hearts. And that's exactly what happened. And so when you think about what, what happened as they, as they went up against these great kings, uh, the battle belonged to the Lord, not to the people. They didn't have the power to overcome Og and, or, or uh, overcome uh, Sihon. Uh, because if you go throughout the Old Testament, which I did this week, you will find the battle uh, against Sihon. It was so jaw-dropping, I mean, historically to the people, that they never forgot it. So you encounter it in Numbers 21, Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34, Joshua chapter 2, Judges chapter 11, 1 Kings chapter 4, Nehemiah 9, Jeremiah 48. It's everywhere. What do they want to say? Do not forget when we were outnumbered, when we didn't have heavy weaponry, when we didn't have skill to battle, God led us to attack from the south, heading north, Sihon, the mighty, amazing warlord of, of the Amorites, and God enabled us to defeat him. It wasn't us. And then they went up uh, north uh, uh, to the east side of the, the, the uh, Sea of Galilee uh, into the land of Bashan, and they took on Og. Uh, Og is uh, one of the Rephaim. Uh, this is a whole other study. If you go back to Genesis chapter 6, part of the Noahic flood, uh, God took out the Nephilim, the giants, uh, but there were other, other giants post-flood uh, called the sons of Anak or Anakim uh, or the Rephaim. Uh, and Og was one of those. What does that mean? That means he was a big dude. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3, uh, verse 11, says that his bed was 13 feet by 6 feet. This was king size. This is a cow king before there was cow kings. This is huge. The bed was 13 feet long by 6 feet wide, made of basalt, black stone. Imagine how, they estimate that he had to be at least 12 feet tall. So if you think Goliath was, was big, here's another giant. Uh, and, and this was long before David took on uh, Goliath. This is, this is Og uh, of, the, of the sons of the Rephaim. And the Israelites could have said he's got 60 fortresses, he's got heavy armor, he's got well-trained seasoned soldiers, and who are we? And God says, no. Do not fear, I am with you. I am with you. So based on Deuteronomic law, they had to give them terms of peace. And when they rejected terms of peace, then they attacked them. And of course, they didn't accept the terms of peace, so Israel attacked and God gave them the victory. It was because of God's strategy, not their strategy. And you look at this and you think to yourself, okay, so God enabled them to, uh, to take over Sihon and Og, uh, but what's that got to do with me? Do you not think that you're still in a battle? Because if you are a Christian, you are still fighting spiritual Ogs and spiritual Sihons. I mean, consider Ephesians 6. What does Paul say? Because in Hebrews 4, he tells, uh, the author tells us we're heading to Canaan land. We all are. We're this, this world is not my home. I'm just a what? I'm just a passing through. But in the meantime, verse 10 of Ephesians 6 says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, not your might, Put on the full armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil or the wiles of the devil, depending on your translation. For our struggle as a Christian is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers. These are all words for, words for demonic powers in the Greek text. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the forces of world darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. He says, you think you, you're fighting wicked people? No. He says, you as a Christian fight the devil and his minions one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, behind the scenes. In the wickedness that you see, you can see the origin of it. And so to, to be able to take on the, the, the devil and his minions, Paul says you need to put on the full armor of God, and you have a sword. What is that sword when you go into battle? Well, it's, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. Who would want to go into a battlefield with no flak jacket and, and no helmet? I mean, those are the things you roll into if there's, if there's a problem. And who would not want to grab their weapon as you're heading into battle? And so he says as a Christian... Make sure you put on the full armor of God. I mean, to be all about truth, to be all about righteousness, to be about, about the gospel, feet shod with the gospel, to be all about the shield of faith, to be all about salvation, but to make sure that you got the word of God is your weapon. And to use a weapon well, you have to, you have to study that weapon, do you not? You have to use that, that particular weapon. And I don't apologize for calling it a weapon because the word of God is a, is a weapon that the devil hates because it destroys darkness. It, it takes him down. It throw, holds back evil. And so when we look at uh, our journey to Canaan land as Israel's journey to Canaan land, we have much to thank God for because he has armed us to be victorious. 
So when God gives you a victory in spiritual war, um, you should pause and give God thanks for said spiritual victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, For we as Christians walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What fortresses is he talking about? He says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of God. And we are ready to punish all disobedience wherever your obedience is, whenever your obedience is complete. Paul says, as a spiritual uh, warrior out on the field of battle against your Amorites, realize that, that you're dealing with demonic forces that you cannot see, that God and the angels can see, but God will empower you as you're putting on the armor of God to take them on. And you, you do it by taking the ideologies that you hear that are false ideologies and evaluating them because not all truth is true, right? There are things that are false masquerading as truth. And so you evaluate, you test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And you take these speculations that our world teaches, these worldviews that are totally godless, and you deconstruct them. You show their logical inconsistencies. You show them how they, de- they contradict the word of God. And you're not afraid to speak up. What does our world need today? Uh, brave Christian spiritual warriors heading to Canaan land. Brave. Who are not afraid. Doesn't matter whether you're a preacher, a teacher, um, a soldier, a sailor, an airman, a professor, a law enforcement officer, a doctor, a nurse, a banker, a tree trimmer. It doesn't matter who you are. If you love Christ, you should have the armor on every day, the word of God with you. And you should not be afraid to deconstruct the false things that you hear from people and point them to the truth of the gospel of Christ. Because so much is at stake. I know, as Moses did, that the way is hard. Indeed, it is. But we know who is with us on the way, and that's the Lord. Snapshot number four, the last one is, uh, is like a spy satellite view of the earth. He goes from the granular to, let's go into outer space and look back at the nation. And he says in, verse, uh, in this particular verse, who remembered us as Israelites in our lowest state? And, and he has res- rescued us from our adversaries. And who is the one who gives food to all flesh even when they hate him? He still feeds them. I mean, he makes his rain, his sun to shine on the, on the righteous and the unrighteous. I mean, God is merciful. And that's what he's saying. God is merciful. But he says, we need to fle- think back as a nation that when we were nobody, and we are still some, still nobodies before his greatness, God saw us as somebodies, and he redeemed us. Uh, I know a lot of people struggle with self-esteem. Uh, it comes and goes in everybody's life. Uh, and God says, when I look down from heaven uh, in your lowest state, I hear you. I see you. I see what you're struggling with. I see what you cry over. I, I see what's a problem for you. I, th- I see what's your frustration you're anxious about. I understand your lowest state, and he says three times in a row here, but I am loyal in my love toward you because loving kindness is everlasting which means in your low estate whether you're going through a divorce you got a wayward child i mean whatever it is your battle he says no i see your low estate and he doesn't just see he moves to show his love to you in due time what should you do when you see his love shown toward you when you have low estate because he will like he did to this young family this week uh Verse 26 tells you what you should do. What should you do? It tells you. It's a, it's a call to thanks. And it, he's, he ends with how he started. And I told you this is a, it's a rhetorical device called inclusio. You start and, and finish the same way. Uh, it's powerful. What does he say you should be doing? Well, see, I came to church today. I haven't any idea what was Marty talking about. Uh, here it is. What are you supposed to do? Give thanks to God, to the God of heaven, for his loving kindness is everlasting. He who, he who is in heaven considers your lowest state and moves in a jaw-dropping way sometimes, sometimes in smaller ways. And your job as a Christian is to stop and say, God, thank you, thank you for that. Because you're called to praise him. And if you do it publicly, well, everybody else gets blessed too. Nothing better. Let's pray. God, help us to give thanks in all things. Uh, Tough times, uh, turbulent times, great times, times of great blessing. Might our mouths always utter great thanks for you for how great you are and how loving you are toward us. Your loving kindness indeed is everlasting. May we not forget that and live each day as the Israelites were called to live, uh, courageous for you in dark days, knowing you shall lead us and you shall give us victories along the way that we can tell our grandchildren about in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.